Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Connor Nielsen, and joining me on his very own channel is the Comics Kid 2099. How you doing, Comics Kid? I'm doing very well. How are you? I am doing excellently. Uh, today, we actually got a chance uh, a month early, because we were at the Venice Film Festival, to go see Joker, uh, the new film by Todd Phillips, starring Joaquin Phoenix. And, uh, I mean, we were going to just, like, say, we didn't, we didn't want to, like, you know, uh, boast and, uh, you know, kind of flaunt our creds around, our press credentials, uh, because we got to see it a, a whole month early with, mm -hmm. with the original press. You know, got to win the Golden Lion and all that. And so, I mean, I know it comes out on Friday, but, you know, why don't we just put it out early? And, uh, you know, we couldn't wait anymore. Uh, so, I'm just kidding. <laughs> We're not going to talk about Joker. I have not seen Joker. And a comics kid, I don't think you're ever going to see Joker, are you? I don't know. Uh, if it ever shows up on, like, Netflix, I will watch it. But I, I don't want to – it doesn't look like a movie I would enjoy watching. Uh, instead, we're going to talk about Scott Pilgrim versus the world, because I mean, right now, who isn't talking about Scott Pilgrim? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is actually um, a video we've talked about doing for a long time, at least two years. Yeah, I say. yeah. We, um, for anyone who doesn't know, we used to do a podcast together. First, we were talking about the original two seasons of Twin Peaks. Then we talked about Fire Walk With Me. Uh, then for a period of time, we also did a special video on the deleted scenes from Fire Walk With Me. Uh, we did a video talking about what we would like to see in what our, our hypothetical ideal season three of Twin Peaks, because by that point we knew that we were getting Twin Peaks The Return. And then we did various videos talking about – we also did Twin Peaks The Return, one episode on each episode. But we did various videos where we would take a cast member from Twin Peaks and watch something from their filmography. And so Michael Sarah was in – one episode of Twin Peaks The Return, so ever since then, we were like, hey, he was in Scott Pilgrim. What if we talk about that? So yeah, it's been since Twin Peaks The Return that we've been wanting to do this, I guess. Well, it's been a little bit before for me, because uh, in 2017, you were doing your 365 uh, graphic novel review challenge. Yeah. And I want to say it was January where you talked about the Scott Pilgrim books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all um, six or seven. Yeah, I think there's seven of them. That makes, uh, makes sense. I I've been purchasing the colored hardcovers for my girlfriend, mm -hmm. so I think they're seven. Um, I, I don't, I haven't purchased all of them yet, but um, when, but I, I knew that Michael Sarah was going to be in Twin Peaks season three, but that had not come out yet because it was January of 2017, mm -hmm. and I think we had a rule where it was like you can't, like it has to be out now. You know what I mean? We can't be like, well. Naomi Watts is gonna be in Twin Peaks, so let's talk about King Kong. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, and if that was the case, Jackie Brown would have been on my uh, <laughs> would have been on my list. But um, so I, I knew that after the return, I'd want to talk about um, Scott Pilgrim. And uh, since you weren't gonna watch Joker, we were gonna do this a few months ago. And uh, yeah, so I was gonna rewatch it because I'm rewatching a bunch of movies from the 2010s from the year 2010 and my little brother has always wanted to watch this movie and my girlfriend loves this movie and she wanted to rewatch it so we made it a movie night uh so comics kid why don't you explain the plot of scott pilgrim versus the world i can do that um so michael Sarah plays scott pilgrim who is in a band called sex bomb uh which is named after the thing in the mario video games and uh he is dating a high school girl. In fact, that's literally the first line of the movie. Scott Pilgrim was dating a high school girl. And um, then he meets this other girl named Ramona Flowers, and she is literally his dream girl. She shows up in a dream before he even meets her. And then uh, he starts dating her, and then the rest of the movie is he has to defeat uh, her seven evil exes in combat, uh, vid very video game-styled combat, uh, for, her, for him to win her love. And so that's the plot of the movie, and it's also the plot of the comics that this movie is based on. Uh, Connor, what do you think of this movie? So Scott Pilgrim vs. the World is one of those movies that is, I think is it's great entertainment. Um, it's very watchable. It's very entertaining. Um, I really enjoy watching it. I don't know if I can say I love it, though. Um, but if it's on, I'll watch it. This is one thing, though, that a lot of people I know do absolutely love it and i don't fault them at all for it i completely understand why um and what's interesting is i'm talking like uh our colleague Rasco, who has been on a couple of our uh spoiler podcast discussions um mm -hmm. he loves this movie like this is one of his all-time favorite movies um and this is directed by edgar wright who's a very 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 great filmmaker um and 
for me, the Edgar Wright movie that I love is Baby Driver. And it's interesting, me and Rasko's relationship with Baby Driver and Scott Pilgrim is inverted. So that, I, I think there's a pattern there, is what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. So um, I do really like it, though. Um, the most impressive thing about this movie is its editing, uh, which is incredible. But also impressive here is the cast, especially all the up-and-comers that they cast yes. before they all hit it big. is unheard of. It's insane. Uh, it's such a strong vision. The special effects are great. Um, it's, it's just a very well-constructed movie. And I've seen it now like three times in the last year. It's a really good movie. It's a great movie. And mm-hmm. so, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's pretty good. cool. Uh, what do you think about this movie, Comic Skip? Uh, so you mentioned that I uh, reviewed the comics that this is based on. I, um, I've only read through the whole series once, um, but, you know, I read, read it, you know, 2000, well, I guess it was very late 2016 when I was getting ready to do the 2017 uh, 365-day challenge. But um, read through that whole series, and then earlier this year, I reread Volume 1, and actually donated it to a thrift store just to, I, I wanted to do, cause I was realizing I was getting to a point where I was running out of room for all the books that I have. And so I wanted to see like, is there anything that I can feel okay getting rid of? And I didn't want to get crazy with it. I didn't want to just start giving away everything and, and then realize, wait, I really should have kept that book. But I reread Scott Pilgrim volume one and I was like, uh, this is enjoyable, but um, I, I got rid of that book. But then watching this movie, this is maybe the fifth time that I've seen it because uh, there are, I think, three audio commentaries on this movie. And so earlier this year, or I want to say it was earlier this year, I watched the movie, and then I listened through all the audio commentaries. So I was in and out watching it, but I was listening through the commentaries. So this is now my second time just watching the movie, but my fifth time kind of experiencing the movie overall. Um, and I agree with your assessment, but we may come to different points of why we think this way. But I, I think this is a really fun movie. I don't necessarily I, I I'm not sure where my like critical analysis is gonna land here because <laughs> like when I reviewed volume one, I think this is paraphrasing, but I said that ev- I loved everything about that book except for the main character of Scott Pilgrim. And I feel like this movie is kind of like shining a light on that. Like saying Scott Pilgrim is not a great guy, but he goes through a journey throughout this movie. And I guess by the end of it, he's gone through self-improvement. But I don't know if the movie has earned that. And I don't know how much of that was deliberate in the comics and how much of that was brought to the movie that wasn't in the comics. Um, And, of course, we're mostly going to be talking about the movie. Have you read any of the comics? I have not. Okay. So then we will almost exclusively talk about the movie then. Yeah. um, So the comics is interesting. So... Um, I have a funny story actually about, about the comics. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that Matt kid who was on who reviews the reviewers with us, mm-hmm. um, almost five years ago now, wrap your head around that. Um, <laughs> but um, I know he loves those comics, and he said that um, everyone in this movie is perfectly cast except Scott Pilgrim, and that's his biggest issue with this movie. Um, and I heard. A similar cr- criticism from my girlfriend when we first started dating. Now it's actually kind of funny because um, when you're first trying to court a woman, and uh, it's you know of course the 2010s, you text them, right? Yep. And I'm thinking, okay, what do I what do I text this chick about? Like I just want I want to I just want to text her so I can have like you know a correspondence. And so you're looking around as you do, and like what do I text her about? And so at that point I'm working at Amazon because I I did a brief three weeks stint at Amazon between jobs. Mm-hmm. It is a, that, that's a whole story in and of itself. But um, there was this Scott Pilgrim board game or something. And I'm like, wow, she seems a lot like the kind of girl who would really like Scott Pilgrim for some reason. Mm-hmm. And so I texted her, hey, uh, do you do you like comics? Do you read any comics? And I'm like, okay, that's, you know, comics have a certain stigma for certain kinds of people. You, you can never tell who's going to have that stigma. And she said, no, I don't read comics. I can't really get into them. And I'm like, oh, okay. Strike one. We'll come to find out. Yeah, strike one. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no. Um, and then later, she, I, I, I'm like talking to her. I'm like, oh, yeah, so you've never read any comics? And she's like, yeah, no, nah, I can't really get into them. I'm like, okay, okay, we got it. And then I bring up the movie Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, and she went, oh, my gosh, I love that movie. Okay, the comics are my favorite. And I was like, wait, 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 Christy. Whoa, 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 whoa. Um, you got to <laughs> – <laughs> slow down i thought you said you didn't like comics and she's like well 
I, I usually don't, but I like that. I'm like, oh my goodness. I had that hunch and my hunch was right. <laughs> um, so she really likes comics. And uh, um, and her biggest issue with this movie is like the actor who plays Scott Pilgrim, Michael Sarah, And she feels like Ramona is a little disserviced in, in the movie. Um, so I that's you... my story about about my girlfriend and Scott Pilgrim. I thought you were going to say, because you said, you know, when you, you're courting a woman, you text her, I, and you're like, what do I text her about? I thought you were going to say, uh, OMG, Neil, you are so hot. Um, <laughs> that, um, oh my God. That's, a, that's a moment in the movie. Um, that's, that's really funny. <laughs> so, so do you think that Michael Sarah is the problem? Because I, I felt like Scott Pilgrim himself was the problem in the book, and I feel like a lot of my problems with Scott Pilgrim in the book are in the movie, so I don't know if my problem is Michael Sarah necessarily. Um, what okay. do you? What, what about so you? So it's it's interesting going back because after Superbad, there was like a whole flux of Michael Sarah movies, mm-hmm. like kind of these awkward teen comedies where he was sort of like the the wimpy kid who had to like overcome something. And so you had stuff like um, there was that movie Youth and Revolt that he was in, where he played a wimpy kid who wanted to get with the girl. And she was like too fast for him, and so he like had to like embrace his inner bad boy, you know. And then, mm-hmm. and then you had this came out the same year, and then there was another movie that I can't remember, but it was like after Super Bad, Juno, which is really there was Juno where he got a girl pregnant, but uh, you know he's he's in a lot of those movies at that time, and so I think at the time this came out, there was a lot of. Like, oh, Michael Sarah, you know exactly what you're getting when you get Michael Sarah. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people were kind of getting tired of him. Um, and I think going back, uh, it's aged well, uh, I think. I don't think he's a problem. I actually really like his performance here. He does his thing, and it is his Michael Sarah thing that he does all the time that he's been doing since, like, Arrested Development. But I think he's good at doing that thing. And, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. But what I think is interesting about Scott Pilgrim as a hero is that he uh, he is like, what if we centered an action story around somebody who was like the opposite of an action hero? They're very like introverted uh, and uh, they like all their, everything about them is very internal. They're not externally strong. They're not externally uh, personable. They're not externally much of anything, but uh, the, the relationship stuff here is really what it's all about and all the action and all the special effects and craziness it's all a visual representation of inner turmoil and that's what it's all kind of about and i think that michael Sarah does a good job of it's like you know talking and being a person but the way he talks and the way he carries himself you can tell there's a lot on his mind and he's not a very confident person so he has a lot of internal struggles so i think he's a decent choice Having, of course, not read any of the comics, mm-hmm. um, but I mean, this is a much better movie than like Youth and Revolt is. So, yeah. Yeah, I um, now I'm kind of curious what everyone doesn't like about Michael Sarah in it because, I guess what I was what I was saying earlier, my problem in the and this is a big plot point in the movie too, but well, first of all, like the very first conversation in the movie is these guys talking about how Michael or uh, sorry Scott Pilgrim is 22, I think they said, and He's dating a 17-year-old, and uh, I guess hot to- hot button topic issue here. But like, I don't I don't like uh, it, it's. I mean, they make a point of saying that like they haven't done anything together. They haven't even held hands. So like, how icky is it? But I'm still a little icked out by it. Um, like if you've got, and I guess someone could say like, you know, the number 18 is like fairly ar- arbitrary, and someone just kind of pulled that one out of a hat. And like, she's 17, so you know, it's not too icky but i'm still a little icked out by it um and that's yeah and then but in some states and i know this takes us in canada but in some states that age is 17 so right yeah um and i i don't know what it is where i live i don't know where it is where where you live or in canada but for me just in my personal mind i would say let's just draw that line at 18 and keep it a hard line um (laughs) Yeah, and I say that as someone I don't do the dating scene, so you know it it's a moot point for me anyway. But um, and they and I think they and like I said, it's been a little while since I read the books, but I'm sure that they they made it a point where it's like he just wants like a pal to kind of hang out with, um, and so he's not looking for a serious relationship with Knives Chow, um, and but then I guess the further like not great 
personality of Scott is that while he's still dating Knives, he then pursues a relationship with Ramona. And this is where I said I wasn't really sure what my critical analysis was going, where it was going to land, because you can have a story, and generally most stories are going to have a character arc for at least the main character, maybe even multiple characters. Um, and in this, I guess you could say the character arc for Scott Pilgrim is that he starts off being kind of a, uh, as a Ramona, or not Ramona, um, Kim. As Kim says, you are, well, at one point she calls him, you are the salt of the earth. And he says, thanks. She said, no, I meant scum of the earth. Uh, so, like, he starts off being kind of shady. Like, he's dating two girls at once, and one of them is a 17-year-old. And then by the end of the movie, he's supposed to have moved past that. And he's grown up and matured as a person. And that's his character arc. And that's, you know... All movies have characters who, well, most movies will have characters who change in some way over the course of the film. And my problem is, like, Scott, it's like he comes to this big realization where it's like, oh, I was terrible. I shouldn't have done these things. And I'm thinking, no one should be should have to be told that they were doing terrible. Like, <laughs> that's something you should have known. Um, and so I don't know if I'm, like, if I'm okay with that being his character arc by the end or if I feel like he should have already been at that point when the movie started. That's, uh, that's a fair criticism. And I, I will say my my one thing uh, in terms of the casting of Michael Sarah is that it's referenced a couple times that he's like a breaker of hearts, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm like, my Michael Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> her? <laughs> this guy? <laughs> yeah, her. Um, Which, by the way, he, so you've got, he, you've got Anne from uh from arrested development she plays rocket or roxy or yes she plays yeah, the roxy. the one female evil ex and then you've got michael sarah who is uh george michael in arrested development and then there's also a scene where he says it was it's that scene where he's telling ramona it was a mutual dumping and the narrator says it wasn't and i was like that's totally <laughs> arrested development um which that has to be arrested development. <laughs> this was because there was like a good little hiatus for arrested development wasn't there like in between uh it was more than just a high, like it was straight up canceled like and we didn't know if you're we ever going to get a season uh four and you know maybe maybe desire is better than reality in some uh -huh. in some like, cases but uh, this was during that time where everyone just wanted more arrested development okay i'm i'm thinking i'm thinking that was a reference but um yeah so you're right like michael Sarah does not strike me as um leading man like in the sense, and, and in some ways, it's it's you know like you said earlier, where he's strong internally, but not necessarily a big buff like like a you know Chris Evans who's in this movie. He's not that type of guy. <laughs> um, but yeah, well, I don't even, I don't even know if I'd call him strong. He's actually a very he's very selfish, and that's like yeah. his one flaw. Like that's his big flaw is that everything kind of comes down to him being selfish. And um, there's that part where. Kieran Culkin, who steals this entire movie. Yes, he's in. yes. He, he says, you need to break up with her. And then he goes, it's hard. <laughs> like, Double that standard. Is like, <laughs> I, there, there's so many quotable lines in this movie, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, Anna Kendrick was in this movie. Oh, my jeez. <laughs> Everyone is in this movie. Uh, so, but, yeah, Anna Kendrick, Aubrey Plaza, uh, Brie Larson, back when yes. nobody knew who she was. Uh, I think she was trying to be a singer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to say... I mean, Chris Evans had done stuff before this. He had been in the Fantastic Four movies. But this movie kind of very – like, it's not like the – because I remember when the trailers for this were coming out. And I remember seeing Chris Evans in the trailers. But it's not like this movie said, starring Chris Evans of the Fantastic Four. You know, it no. it doesn't say, like, look – and, you know, Brandon Ralph. Uh, he was in Superman yeah. Returns before this. And I think he was – I want to say Chuck was before this. But um, the TV yeah, series Chuck. Um but this doesn't like throw Brandon Routh into the promotional material either. Like, uh, it one in fact at one point early in the movie when they've got cardboard cutouts of uh, I don't remember the band name, but uh, Envy and her uh, band. something at the Demon Head, the Clash of Demon Head. Yeah, they've got cardboard cutouts of cu cutouts of them at the uh, video or the the music store, and like Brandon Routh is kind of his face is in shadow, so you can't really tell who it is at that point. Um, so, yeah, there's a, like you said earlier, there was just a ton of, like, hey, it's that guy. Like, uh, and I know Brandon Ralph was doing stuff before this, but I feel like he's even more well-known now. Um, yeah, and then, like, Bill Hader is the narrator of this movie. Mm -hmm. Like, he was still on SNL at this point. Um, there's that part where they go to a party, and, like, that guy who knows everybody, he's yeah. in the office for a moment, like, like, everybody, like, every new scene, there's, like, some person that's like, oh, it's that guy. 
I, I, um, know, I know him. And from then my... Allison, Allison Pill is the drummer, Kim. She's in, like, award stuff now. Like, every year you expect to, you, uh, I expect to see her show up in, like, Oscar contenders. It's it's crazy mm-hmm. who's in this movie. Um, and I think her hair color is not what it is in this. So whenever I see her in something that's not uh, Scott Pilgrim, I'm like, wait, who is that? Like, because I've seen her with, like, darker hair color now. And I'm like, I don't know who that is. Oh, wait, it's her from Scott Pilgrim. Um that, yeah. o- that other guy, the one who knows everyone, uh, I know him from New Girl. He's been in a few episodes of that um, kind of a background, kind of somewhat recurring background character, I guess. Yeah, he's almost like Randall Park from a few years ago. Now yeah. Randall Park's like in everything, and now people know who he is, and mm-hmm. I feel like that guy's probably going to be like that. Pretty yeah. Soon. Um, but yeah, no, the, the cast is insane, and uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead is Ramona Flower. Uh, she was the main character from 10 Clubs of Field Lane. Which um, I just... She had never... I just, oh, you did? Yeah, okay. I just watched that yesterday. Um, and, uh, yeah, she's great. Um, great in this, great in that. Uh, I, I, of course, know her as Gwen from Sky High. Um, oh, but... that's her? Yes, oh, that is okay. her. I, I watched Sky High years ago. That was one of those movies. I I was maybe getting just a little too old for that kind of movie, but I was still watching, like, younger, skewing movies. And I – when did that come out? Because I'm – I was probably, like – 2003? Okay, so I was like 13, 14 at the time, um, or 2005, so I was like oh, almost, really? almost uh, wow, I was right in high school at the time, so I, I still watched that movie a good chunk, uh, yeah, a good fair bit, that was my introduction to Kurt Russell, um, but yeah, uh, I had no idea that was her, I did not know she was acting, of course this was, it's hard for me to, because I only watched Scott Pilgrim for the first time earlier this year, but this movie came out in 2010, and Sky High came out in 2005. But, like, Sky High feels like an eternity ago, whereas this movie yes, doesn't, does. because I only watched it recently, it doesn't feel like it was that long ago. Yeah. Um, oh, man. I was talking about this with Rafko, but it's sort of interesting how, like, every kind of, like, so the, the whole point about this movie is it's about relationships, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, there's, like, when you're, like, a guy and you have, like, different tastes in women, there's different kinds of girls you can go for. Um, and this movie has like all of those kinds of people and they find like the perfect actress who would later grow, go into like grow into be those kind of personas like outside of this movie though. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like you have Anna Kendrick, who's like the sassy, but sweet, like good girl. And then you have Ramona Flowers, who's Mary Elizabeth Winstead. who's kind of like the roguish bad girl, you know? And then you have, um, uh, like Aubrey Plaza, who's the sarcastic workaholic. And then you have like Brie Larson, who's like the kind of stuck up, like big shot, like celebrity. You know what I mean? Like, and mm-hmm. all of them have kind of gone on to like sort of embody those personas in their like acting careers. It's wild. And they all were in this movie together, though. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting. And the, like at this point, they were all in like the it girls on the indie scene. And mm-hmm. so it's weird because we don't think about this movie as an indie movie because it wasn't, but it's it kind of has an indie movie feel though. It feels like an independent film, and uh, I think that kind of comes down to um, it's based on an independent comic and Edgar Wright. Um, yeah, Edgar Wright is a filmmaker who's really good at because it's weird. Like you watch Baby Driver, and that feels like a summer action movie for a Hollywood studio. It still feels like an Edgar Wright movie, but it feels like he's trying to emulate that vibe, and it really emulates that vibe hard. And then this one, you can tell he's kind of going for, oh, a smaller town in Canada. You know, it's about relationships. And, like, there's that part where he's at the party and he's, like, kind of inching closer to Ramona. Mm-hmm. Like, that almost looks like the poster for an indie movie called, like, And There She Was. Yeah. <laughs> you know, or something like that. And um, well, I don't know. I think he does a good job of, of that whole thing. Yeah. yeah um, Edgar Wright, who I don't know if I have seen anything else that he's done, um, but he has that... Uh, reputation as being like an indie filmmaker that somehow got roped into doing bigger budget stuff Um, and so like I mean he started off in uh, like you know quirky low budget British TV shows and then kind of you know worked into the the film side of things but still he has that reputation of he's, he's an auteur who is somehow doing big budget stuff you know yeah um, he's doing this. You, you need to watch Baby Driver, man. Uh, that movie is so good. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess they're making a sequel. I don't know how they're gonna make a sequel, but but they are. Toddler um, Driver. Toddler Driver. Yeah, there you go. 
Um, there's it's a Nicolas Cage. I'm not a baby anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a uh, comic book writer. It was either. Oh boy, I hate that I get these two confused. It was either Becky Cloonan or Gail Simone who said that whenever they see the name Baby Driver, they think of Holy Diver by Dio, and like they they <laughs> sing, sing it as a song. So I just wanted to mention that. That's great. Um, That's great. So, um, what would you say is because I think I agree with you. The pacing of this is amazing. Like it, there's so much of this that. I really like. I was laughing, and by the time I was done laughing, the joke, the movie was already like three jokes ahead of me. Um, like where um, the, there's that bit I mentioned earlier where he says some, there, he's talking about the haircut, and it's like Scott Pilgrim remembered that his last haircut or, or that his last bad haircut was 431 days ago, and <laughs> and then like there's there's parts where um, he will uh, like when uh, Knives is dyeing her hair, and like it's one conversation. But if you pay attention to what she's doing, she's as she dyes her hair, that conversation is taking place over like an hour and a half or more. Because at one point she's putting the dye on her hair, then she's rinsing her hair, and then she's blow drying her hair, and then suddenly she turns around and her hair is perfectly combed. And like all that stuff, like, you know, it's just snap, 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 like and it's very mm -hmm. fastly paced. And that's great because this is based on seven graphic novels, and each graphic novel is anywhere from hundred and fifty to two hundred pages. So it needs to be fast-paced to get through all of the material that it's adapting. Um, and I think it does a really good I have a question, thing. though. Yeah. Did, did I, maybe my memory is failing me. Did this come out before the last graphic novel came out? It did. Um, I had heard people say okay. that. Um, I, cause I, I think the last one was, like, almost done. And I, if I'm not mistaken, one of the commentaries has Brian Lee O'Malley and Edgar Wright on it. And so I think they said that Brian Lee O'Malley basically kind of gave them the cliff notes. Okay, here's what's going to happen in the comic that you can kind of make, the, you know, finish off the movie. There are a few things in the comics that are a little different. Um, like um, the the lead singer of Sex bob he comes out as gay in the last book. But that's n not to, not to uh, diminish, like, the, you know, rep positive representation. But I, I feel like that wasn't necessarily a big part of the comic story, so I can see why they didn't include that. Or maybe they didn't even know about that. Maybe that was something that Brian Lee O'Malley didn't tell them about. But, like, there's a few minor things that are different from what I remember that are different in the books that in the movie. But for the most part, I feel like it kind of hits that same, you know, path, just, you know, skipping some of the steps, if you will. Now, you've read them. Does this feel a lot like the experience of reading those books does? Yes, but in a way... I, I think part of it, I think this is superior to reading those because, like, when you read a comic book and there's a sound effect, for me, I just glance right over that. I hardly ever pay attention to a sound effect unless it's, like, an especially weird one, like, with an unusual spelling, then I'll momentarily laugh at that. But I usually, you know, sound effects are just there. Like, I don't really pay much attention to them. But this movie, a couple of times actually puts the sound effect words on the screen, like the 60s Batman used to do, kind of. Mm -hmm. And so... Even though, like, this is doing the same kind of thing that the comic does, because it's in a different medium, it comes across, I, I'm noticing a lot, noticing it a lot more. And so there are jokes that when you're reading something, you're going at your own pace. You, you know, I, I don't want to say there's no such thing as pacing when you're reading something because, you know, a, a story could take forever to get to a place. But the fast, frenetic pacing that this movie has is kind of lost when you're reading the books. Um it, I got gotcha. you. Because you maybe that's just the Edgar Wright thing, because all of his movies are super fast paced. Mm -hmm. So what I was I was asking you because it was like if this maybe I haven't read the books, but this does feel like an Edgar Wright movie, but it also feels like something else. And maybe I want to read the books, but it might be a good like combination of both reading the books, but also watching an Edgar Wright movie. Okay. Yeah. Um... It might be because I need to, like you said, I need to watch more of his movies. Um, like I know, I know of his movies. I know he did that. I remember seeing trailers for the one at the end of the world or World's End. Um, yeah. And um, and then like there's some movies that I think of. I'm like, that was Edgar Wright. Oh wait, no, it wasn't. Like for some reason, I was thinking he did <laughs> Super Bad, and I was like, that wasn't him. Uh, <laughs> That'd be funny. Yeah. Um, he did Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz and The World's End. Um, he did Ant Man. No, he didn't. He did. Uh, he did the storyboards for Ant Man, which are the best part of Ant Man. And then he, uh, 
he did uh, Scott Pilgrim and then Baby Driver. And I think that's it. And um, his next movie is going to be a horror movie. And oh. it's going to star Anya Taylor Joy from Split and The Witch. So and, that's really cool. And, and the upcoming New Mutants movie. Let's, let's fingers crossed that that oh. was. <laughs> I'm. <laughs> I, I don't know. Anyway, um, I'm, I'm sorry. Go sorry. Very quickly on that subject. Um, did you hear that it they celebrated their two year anniversary from when they finished <laughs> shooting that movie? <laughs> I shouldn't laugh because I want to watch that movie, but I have no hope of it being good. So, um, yeah, we'll see. Um, but yeah, so that doesn't seem like that. Like when you look at because this movie is almost ten years old, but it, it doesn't seem like his career is that long. And I guess part of it is like. He spent some time working on Scott on uh, Ant Man, and then that never he didn't officially direct that. Um, and then like he did some stuff like a there was a TV series that Simon Pegg was in called Spaced, um, and that was like in the late '90s when he did that. Um, so I guess he's done some stuff that wasn't in movies, but um, it seems like he's been around for a while. But it doesn't seem like he's directed that many movies. No, he's only done five, which. You know, if he started in like the late '90s, that's around the time that uh, Christopher Nolan did. Nolan made ten movies, uh, but he did give us the uh, Grindhouse trailer, "Don't," which is pretty funny. Yeah, I think I remember that one. Um, where it wasn't it? It was like if you're thinking of telling someone about this movie, don't. And it's just like across <laughs> across the screen, just big words. <laughs> yeah, um, and the the joke with that one is that it's a. Uh, it's a British horror movie, but they're advertising it for American audiences, so none of the, you don't hear any of the actors actually talk in the trailer. <laughs> so, if you feel like going through that door, don't. <laughs> great, great. I need to that remind. I need to go back and rewatch the Planet Terror and uh, Death Proof again. Um, the I, I feel like I had something I was going to say about the. Uh, about this movie. Um, do you think, because, so, talking about the pacing, and, like, I think the pacing is really good for, like, you know, some of the joke stuff, like, where it will throw a joke out, and then editing will, like, have it happen in such a way, like, there's another one, kind of like where Knives was dyeing her hair, where he said something about, like, where are we going? And then it cuts to them on the sidewalk, and one of them says, I told you, we're going to this thing. And then it cuts to them, like, right in front of the door of where they're going. Like, you know, it's, it's very quickly, like, and it's very interesting filmmaking, I think, because they could have just as easily had them all be in Scott's apartment, and he, they had that same conversation where they don't move. And I'm sure it was very difficult filmmaking, because you're having to film in three different locations as opposed to just one, but it's also much more interesting filmmaking. And it keeps me m more interested in watching the movie when I'm having to pay attention to what's going on on the screen a lot more. Like, if it was all a conversation that happened in someone's apartment... I would have been more tempted to look down at my phone or something, but the way they did it, I'm constantly keeping my eyes glued to the TV to see if they do anything else kind of weird like that. It is incredibly engaging. Another instance of something like that is where he sees Ramona at the library, mm -hmm. and then he's on that staircase in the library, and you see Stephen, the, the lead singer of Sexville Bomb, you see his head come in from the left side of the screen and goes, and then blinks, and immediately they're in uh, young Neil's living room where they're, where they're practicing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh my, what just happened? You know, it's like this very disorienting effect, but um, it's very engaging and it's very, like, you know, stylistic and very, like, um, like you know, Edgar Wright's flexing how good of an editor and, like, mm -hmm. he's, like he, he's doing all that. But um, it does, it's not just showy for the sake of showy, you know? It, it, it's, it's, that character is in a state of, like, he's in a daze, you know? He's like, enamored with this girl and he's like he's just kind of daydreaming the whole time and he's just kind of floating through his day and so you're just seeing the day kind of just fly on by him and it, it, it recreates that kind of disorienting feeling of when you kind of daydream and get caught in your head you're like oh where did the last 20 minutes go mm -hmm. and um it's really really good stuff and um another like he does there's a lot of stuff here that's practically done and as opposed to doing cgi and um, I will say I've always been a proponent of if you can do it as a practical effect, do it, because I've always said it generally looks more real. Um, having said that, I think in just the last year, CGI has made leaps and bounds. It actually kind of scares me because, like, you'll see a video that was originally Allison Brie doing an interview with Conan O'Brien, and then somebody has digitally imposed Jim Carrey's head on Allison Brie's body, and it looks flawless, and that's, like, disturbing, like, the most, like, the stuff of nightmares. And so, like, 
I feel like movies are making this like huge jump where CGI is going to look a lot better. Where like you know, a few, just a couple years ago we were having conversations about Rogue One and whether Moff Tarkin looked like the guy who played Moff Tarkin, yeah. and I feel like we're not going to be having those conversations anymore. But this movie, and of course, again, it seems a lot more new to me than than what it is. But like, there's scenes where you would look at something and you would think, oh, naturally they would do that as a CGI thing. Um, but they don't. Like, there's uh, in the first battle uh, with uh, Matthew Patel, there's these demons, de- demon ladies who are all like he's floating above the the crowd, and then there's these semi-translucent demon ladies and. I don't want to say they're semi-translucent. They probably, I think they just, they're no color. Like, they, they're black and white. But um, they're all, like, they were for real hanging off of these harnesses. And in one of the commentaries, they talked about how, like, that was a little uncomfortable for them because they had to hang there for a little while to get the shots right. And then um, there's another where uh, when Scott goes in to pee and there's the pee bar that <laughs> goes down as he pees. Yes. He's in... A house. He goes in the bathroom and, well, and closes the door, and then when he opens the door, suddenly it's lockers in a school. And I think they said that was somehow uh, practical. I think they said they had like two rooms, and they spun around the room that Scott was in, and like, or that Michael Sarah was in, and like that one to me looked really difficult to do. But um, I'm glad to see more of that done in movies. And again, like my whole thing about CGI is sometimes I can tell, hey, that looks really fake. But we're probably getting to that point where that's going to be less of a problem. But I still enjoy seeing practical effects in use whenever it is in use. Yeah. Um, and the special effects in this movie are generally just are all around very good. Like all around, there's this movie, I think, looks perfect mm-hmm. for what it is trying to be. Because like even like the, the very CG heavy special effects, they look. They don't look real, but they look real in the context of this universe that is created. Because mm-hmm. this is a movie that is based on a comic book, so it has comic book elements in it, and it's also in this bizarre like video game universe. And so it's like this mishmash of all of these different things all at once. And so it and but it, it does so in a way that doesn't look like a freaking mess. Mm-hmm. It looks very coherent, which is impressive into itself and the visual design of like everything from the sets to the costumes to the way it's lit to the way they photograph everything and then when you put the special effects on top of it it all looks like an organic universe that you're looking at like the part where the sword comes out of his chest doesn't look like an actual sword coming out of his chest but it looks real in the context of this world you know it doesn't look visually jarring and so i found all of that very impressive yeah, um, I uh, a lot of that I, I really liked, and that's the kind of thing I usually don't uh, take much note of. But it's still it, the best thing I feel like I can say about it is that it wasn't jarring, and I I liked it, but it didn't take me out of the movie. You know, like if it was done by someone else, it very easily could have been more distracting, but it wasn't. It felt very much part of this world you're watching, and so I was more. I, I guess I was so engaged with it that. I didn't stop to say, hey, that look at that effect right there. Like, you know, it all feels very seamless. I agree. Um, I also like a lot of little touches in this movie, like where Ramona is like, yeah, I dye my hair every week and a half. Get used to it, dude. <laughs> and then later around, I want to say like act two ends, she's dyed her hair again. So, yeah, that um, I like that. Oh, so good. Um so is there anything uh, – I feel like uh, we're kind of talking more about the uh, the broad stuff that uh, – kind of in the movie. Are there are there any specifics that you want to get into? Because one thing I I really liked about this – let me pull up my, my letterbox review. If anybody is listening and would like to know my thoughts on movies as I'm watching them, check out my letterbox account. I have a lot of reviews. Huh. Um, uh, I, I guess while you pull that up. I, one thing about the pacing that I, I wasn't sure if this was a problem or not, and since you have not read the books, I'll ask you, do you think that the movie at any point kind of goes too fast, specifically with the evil exes that he has to fight? Um, I think that the, the twins they have to fight is yeah. – that feels very – like why do they have to be evil exes? Like they, they don't feel like they have – at that point, Gideon is already like getting with her. Um, you don't hear 
how she like maybe she has a story about how he date she dated both of them, but like I don't know. I think I don't it's even... a throwaway line. That's just a throwaway line, though, isn't it? Like both I think of them so. at the same yeah. time. What? Because um, and, and all... like yeah, that... all the others, she has some kind of story. Like she has a story with Matthew Patel. She has a story with Todd. And and what I like about those is that when she goes into flashback mode, you're actually seeing Brian Lee O'Malley's art showing her flashbacks. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, although they didn't do that with Gideon, and I was a little disappointed because with the Gideon flashbacks, it's actually like footage of her and uh, Jason Schwartzman. But um, you get a story behind most of them, um, except for yes. um, you don't really get much of a story with uh, Roxy other than like it was a phase. But um, with the twins, by that point, she's already kind of on the outs with Scott. And, like, her, it's Scott's friends who say, oh, she dated both of them at the same time. And so it's conjecture. But you're right. Like, that feels the most disconnected from everything else. And I think they got – I don't think those two actors even can speak English, if I'm not mistaken. I think that they, hmm. they got some people who were – from somewhere else and they did not I, I'm, I'm remembering this from like months ago listening to one of the commentaries but I'm pretty sure those guys did not know any English and so it feels even more disconnected because they don't they don't have much of a personality because they don't actually talk to Scott you know I can tell you a little bit about Matthew Patel even if it's just that he's Indian like you know I can mm -hmm. tell you a little bit about him but with those guys I know nothing about him and I, it's been so long since I've read the books, and I want to say that even in the books, though, that those two guys had more personality. Like, I think their their fight scene was a little bit more drawn out in the books because it was two guys that he had to fight. Um, but I think yeah, about... but at least with like you're right. But at least with like going to Roxy, she at least shows up twice. Yeah. So it's like you get more time with her, and those two don't even have lines. Mm -hmm. so. Um. And I was, I definitely agree with you about the twins, because that's what I was thinking of. I watched the movie earlier today. I was thinking it kind of with Roxy, because you, her and Todd, if you're watching the story, it happens, like, in one night. Like, Scott fights Todd, and then he's, he's like, putting the soda can on his head, because he has a headache. And then they go to this other party, and then he fights Roxy there. And so that, to me, felt like those mm -hmm. were a little bit crushed together. But I'm also, like, I can't have my cake and eat it too because I'm talking so much about how great the pacing is and it's really fast paced and it you know you, you, it's just keeping you going so I can't complain about it blowing past some of the plot stuff and congratulate it on having such a fast pace so I, I think I like the pacing um, I guess maybe I just wish that some of the stuff that was in the books could have been in the movie but I know it couldn't have been while maintaining this pace yeah well not the thing like the pacing is very good but i think that end of act two um my brother kind of mentioned this and i agree it, it's a, it's the appropriate word it does get a little exhausting mm -hmm. um because especially with the end of act two where it's like all this stuff kind of happens where um he like scott has to get all kind of frustrated and annoyed with the whole evil x thing and they need to have a bit of a fight and then roxy needs to show up and then they need to have like a couple of days where they're not seeing each other and then they run back into each other and then Gideon's in. It's like, it's like a whole lot of stuff that kind of have to happen. And that's like the emotional low point. Um, yeah. Which so. in any other movie, that emotional low point, I feel like would have more room to breathe. Um, and, and in the books, I want to say that when she said, when she and him kind of have their argument that there's like a good chunk of an entire volume where they're not together. I, I think um, I really wish I had gone to the library and, cause, and reread some of these before uh, talking about this, but I'm pretty sure in the books, like, they spend a little bit more time apart, but in the movie, it's pretty much just a scene um, between her saying, you know, like, she gives him the list, and then the next thing you know, she's with Gideon. Um, and so, um, I, you're right, like, I, it, because um, I'm trying to think of a good example of, like, where a character hits their low point in, you know, right before the final act. And in another movie where it would feel like it has more weight, but here the movie has to maintain that pace. And so that to me didn't feel like it had as much weight as it normally would elsewhere. Yeah. I, and, and I will say like, and I, I agree with what you're saying. It's like right when this movie maybe feels like, okay, it was good while it lasted. Now it's getting a little tired. Then Jason Schwartzman, Schwartzman shows up and he steals the movie. And he is mm -hmm. so so awesome in this movie um hey you know what think about it this way 
if it wasn't for uh, me, she wouldn't have ended with you. And if it wasn't for you, she wouldn't have gone back to me. <laughs> it's uh, like, uh, no, it's great. <laughs> I think in one of the commentaries, Schwartzman said that, and he said this twice in the commentary, and the first time I thought he was joking. He said he was wearing a, a, whim, a woman's thong to, like, get in the character's head. And I thought, oh, that's funny. That's a funny thing they said. And then, like, an hour later in the commentary, that someone else mentioned the thong he was wearing, and I thought, oh, maybe he wasn't joking. That's that's an odd choice. And, like, I mean, I, I have, you know, if you're a guy and you like to wear women's underwear, like, I'm not judging. But I did think it was weird that he said he needed to do that to get in the character's head. Um, but, yeah, Jason Schwartzman is hilarious. And um, I, I just haven't, I haven't watched a ton of his filmography. Um, and he's been in, like, a... Uh, there was a movie that he was in with, um, oh, it's the lady from uh, Orange is the New Black. Um, and it was, I remember seeing a trailer for it, and it was one of those trailers that was like really The Overnight. Weird. Okay, yeah. Um, and I watched like five minutes of that movie, and I was like, nope, I can't do it. This is awkward and weird, and I'm, I can't get into this. Um, and But like, he's funny, but I think a lot of the things that he chooses to be in are things that I'm like, I don't think I can watch that. Like, that looks like really odd and like awkward like the overnight that one was like i no thanks i can't do that did you uh have you seen any of wes anderson's movies because he's a wes anderson regular um i saw island of dogs was he in that or did he do a voice in that yeah he was one of the dogs uh, okay. but it's almost useless having uh you know oh was he a voice in a wes anderson movie because they all sound the same in a wes anderson <laughs> movie so he was He's the guy who talked like this in a monotone voice. <laughs> That's a very good um, – anyone in a Western – I was going to say Brian Cranston, and I was like, wait, I, I, I can't remember anyone's name. My joke is ruined. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I uh, – and was he in the Royal Tenenbaums? I think so. I've never seen the Royal Tenenbaums. Okay. That, I knew that was one of the Wes Anderson side. Uh, I've seen, like, two minutes of that one. Um but yeah, he's he's really funny in this, and I I feel like they really had to struggle there at the end to try and make him more unlikable because he's very charming and like he does stuff that's just despicable. But when he's on screen, you can't help but like him and want to like him. Um, and so they really had to push him to be more evil, I think, in some of his scenes. Oh, see, I thought he was so douchey from the moment he shows up. Oh, like no. he's likable and charming and funny, but you also just want to sucker punch him. It's really <laughs> funny, like when. When Wallace was like, never mind what I said. Go and kick his ass. Like, like yeah, do it, Scott. So I also like the part was like, what's the password? He's like, ah, whatever. Come yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Like, okay. <laughs> but um, uh, so when it comes to this movie, uh, I, I guess this I'll just read my review from Letterboxd, I suppose. I'll skip things that I've already mentioned. But I say, uh, the best way I can describe Scott Pilgrim versus the world is uh, millennial expressionism. The relationship struggles at the heart of the drama here are those of every era, but what other generation has been so out for emotion and yet so reluctant to change? And what other generation expresses their turmoil and unique brand of uh, toxic relationships as an anime video game fantasy of Gen X pop culture references? Scott Pilgrim vs. the World is a great movie, but I don't love it. Uh, this is for sure a perfect movie for someone, and I completely understand why, but while I do find a lot of it to be relatable in this movie, I also find the emotional beats, while ultimately successful in their storytelling function, to not hit their fullest potential. Uh, and I think I talked about the rest. So, yeah, I think the the there's a lot of references in this movie. Like, there's that whole sequence that's just like a Seinfeld scene, mm. and it's really <laughs> funny. Um, yeah, but I like that. It is one of those things where when I think of, well, it's interesting because I'm like at the tail end of of the millennial era. I'm born in 1995, so I don't know if that's like, like I don't know when Gen Z technically starts, but I am. I think I'm still. I make the millennial cutout. Mm -hmm. um, so most of that generation, Generation Y, is older than me, and so I've spent my whole, I spent my whole childhood looking up at people in Gen X, or not Gen X, but in Gen Y looking at millennials and they act like people in this movie. Mm -hmm. And there's a part of me that's like, come on guys, get with it. Come on, do something. <laughs> Cause there's, there's an, there's an era of like world weariness and um, world weariness isn't the right word because they're weary, but they haven't been out in the world. Um, but there's, I, I mean, I'm not thinking of the right word. Uh, 
whatever. Aubrey Plaza is like the quintessential millennial actress, right? <laughs> so mm. it's like sarcastic and kind of tired with the status quo, but you're not really doing anything to change the status quo. You're just, you just know something's wrong with it, you know? And so I, I think that this movie captures a lot of that anguish and that emotional turmoil and a lot of that, that, and what does, you know, what did we all do as kids? We played video games, you know, Toonami was on TV when we were kids. So it was anime and comic books and video games and, and, you know, reruns of shows that our parents watched like Seinfeld, Simpsons and like all that stuff. And so think about whenever like you go to like an outing or like a kind of party or something, like pay attention to how many times someone just references something, right? What if somebody walks up and goes like, Ooba, right? Let's just say somebody walked up and went, Ooba, my initial reaction would be, what's that from? Because I'm expecting that to be a reference, you know? Mm -hmm. And so this movie does a really good job of speaking with an emotional or sorry, with an original voice, but it is connecting with that generation in such a way that I think is very honest emotionally to that generation. Um, there's a movie that came out in 2010 that a lot of people felt should have won best picture called the social network. And I remember a bunch of old people like boomers and gen X were like, wow, this movie is like, it's the movie for that generation. And I'm like, no, it's not because <laughs> that movie sucks. <laughs> um, so that is the that is the movie for the millennials that people who are not millennials think is the movie for millennials. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Social Network sucks, guys. I've seen that movie so <laughs> many times now. Like, it's not good. I'm I, I don't know what everyone is on with that movie. It's not good. It's well made, but it's, I don't like it. Ah. Anyways, um, but this movie came out the same year as Social Network, and I feel like it connects with an entire group of people so much more, and it speaks it feels like it's speaking to that generation in an emotionally intelligent way, as opposed to the social network, which is a character study where the people telling the story hate every single character in that movie. You mm -hmm. know, like everyone in the social network looks like an idiot or a jerk or some kind of negative word that I could throw at them. You know, mm -hmm. with this movie, Scott Pilgrim's not a good guy, but he, the, the movie's aware of he that learns too. something and there's a tenderness yeah, but like Edgar Wright likes Scott Pilgrim, even if he's not the best person. And so he has a love and affection for that character. Mm -hmm. And while the characters might not get along, you can tell there's a love and affection for all of these characters, no matter how weird they are. And so that's why I really like the way this movie approaches characters and people. Yeah. Um, and you're right. Like, there's more, there's a deeper something in this than. I think what a lot of people gave it credit for, even people who like this movie. And I, I think, would you call this movie a cult classic? I would, because there's, like, I remember when this came out, like, this came out in the summer after my freshman year. So when I came back for sophomore year, there were people who were all about this movie, and they weren't a whole lot of people. But you bring this up in the right crowd, sorry, you, sorry my bad. You bring this up, and you say, hey, has anyone here seen Scott Pilgrim? Nine people out of ten are going to say no. Mm -hmm. That one person who has freaking loves Scott Pilgrim. Oh, yeah. You know? So I'd say it is. I, I would call it a cult classic. Yeah. And, like, I don't remember uh, off the top of my head, like, how it did on as far as, like, making back its money. But uh, I, I kind of. bad. Okay. So, yeah, I'd call it a cult classic. Um, But I feel like um, this is, and I don't know where I was going with that, but um, this is one of those movies that uh, I think you, you can. A lot of people who, when they were talking about it, I remember now, when they when this first came out, a lot of people were kind of just calling this like, this is a really fun, energetic movie that has video game references. And I don't think a lot of people were necessarily giving it enough credit for its human element that it has. But I think, like what you were talking about there, it's very much present in the movie. And I think, I don't even, you know, because like a lot of people, when they, call, when they talk about the dang millennials, they'd rather buy avocados than, you know, buy houses. And, like, you know, they're talking about people who are, like, 17 or 18 who are really in the Gen Z category. Like, millennials mm -hmm. are people who are, like, early 40s. And, like, you know, like, it, it goes back quite a bit further than what, you know, the boomers think. And so, like, I don't even know when all this talk of, like, the millennials are ruining everything. I don't know when that got started. But, like, I don't know if that was necessarily in the public vernacular when this movie came out. But you're right. This has a lot of the attitude of that, you know, demographic. Yeah, I, uh, I really, and I really noticed that with this last watch. Um, um, so 
got a got a question for you. Uh, a little little light air, okay. um, air clearing. Uh, what is your favorite line, or who's your favorite character in this movie? Favorite character is probably Wallace. Like you said earlier, <laughs> Kieran Cullen is a darling. I have not seen him in anything else, but he is hilarious in this. And um, when I first watched it, I I had this thing where I was like, he looks like Macaulay Culkin. And I did <laughs> like, and then I look him up, and I was like, oh, okay. And um, oh, he was in movie forty three. Oh, okay. Um, sorry. Poor kid. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I haven't even seen that. I just remember hearing you talk about how horrible it was. Um, but yeah. Um, I think he's got some of the best lines here. Um, like the part where um he starts making out with uh with Anna Kendrick's boyfriend and she's like, not again. And um, <laughs> when, when Scott is like, what did I do? What do I do? And, it, and he's like, fight. Uh, like all of that was, was great. And again, a lot of that is him, but a lot of it also is editing also. Like mm -hmm. every time that, cause they're sharing a, a, a uh, Scott and Wallace are sharing a bed, but not in a gay way. Like, you know, <laughs> Wallace is gay, but they're they're sharing a heterosexual bed because they don't have enough room for more beds and no money and all that. <laughs> That's such a great touch. That's so awesome. <laughs> and every time when they wake up and there's either a different guy or there's more than one guy, <laughs> like at one point when there's like four people in the bed and they all have some comment about what's going on with Scott. <laughs> <laughs> that and yeah. that's editing right there because like scott sits up then wallace and then like each person sits up and has something to say and uh, i thought that was hilarious um and, it's great. and he's, he's not in enough of the movie like i really wish he was in and again he's probably in the comics more i think all of these characters are probably in the comics a little bit more like i want to say uh scott's sister is in it quite a bit more in the comics but um it's one of those things like when i read it and you know i've read a crap ton of stuff in 2017 so like i don't remember everything about this but um i really wish that his character was in this movie a little bit more yeah uh speaking of which this is the first movie i ever saw anna kendrick in and oh my god i had a crush on her like instantly mm -hmm. um and uh I, I i found out that like because of this movie uh, edgar wright ended up dating her for like three or four years and i'm like hey get what? on your pal Hey, if I was in your position, I'd have done the same thing. <laughs> also, total. This is a total thing I've noticed. Like a bunch of guys are like, "Yeah, Anna Kendrick." Like totally. Yeah. Uh huh. Anna Kendrick for sure. <laughs> Ask any girl. They're like, "Oh no, she looks like a horse. I don't like her. She's ugly." <laughs> like it's it's it, it's a rule. Like it is like it is unprecedented. Every single girl I know is like, "Who? Her Anna Kendrick? No, <laughs> no, 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 no." But guys are like, "Yeah, man. Am I right? You know what I mean?" Yeah. So. Yeah, um, that's just something I've noticed. Um, I need to put that to the test. Just go into <laughs> go into Walmart and just excuse me, ma'am. Uh, do you have a minute to talk about Anna Kendrick? <laughs> uh, that'd be funny. Uh, so what, my who? favorite character is maybe Lucas Lee. Um, okay, yeah. That is uh, Chris Evans' character. Um, there are so many great lines from him where he's like. That was in here, bucko. You're going to hear two clicks. The first is me hanging up. The second is me pulling the trigger. Mm -hmm. That is so funny. Makes me laugh every time. And uh, I also love the line, He punched the highlights out of her <laughs> hair. That <laughs> Apparently guy... that actor got the role just from that line alone. <laughs> he? Have you seen The Spirit? No. Okay, he is uh in the spirit based on the frank miller or no sorry based on the will eisner comic but directed by frank miller uh he plays a young flashback version of the spirit in that and i when i was watching that during that flashback scene i was thinking who is this kid i've seen him in something and he's got like <laughs> this 1920s newsy type look about him in that scene and I'm, so i'm like who is like, he looks familiar but he's dressed weird and then i was like oh okay it, i had to look him up and it's like it's that guy from uh from scott pilgrim and he's apparently been doing stuff since scott pilgrim but it's not stuff that i've seen hmm. okay i'll look into him then um there's so many great lines though like the part where brandon routh punches knives chow he punches the highlights out of her hair i'm, I'm not afraid um, to but be then, <laughs> he's like what I'm a rock star. I don't want yeah. to hit a head of girl. Like, it's so funny. Um, and then the vegan police. Th it's that... Thomas Jane yes. and Clifton Collins Jr. in uncredited cameos. 
and the part where they like de veganize him and then like high five, they yeah. like, they jump and high five. It's so funny. Yeah. Um, and I didn't recognize the other guy, but I did recognize Thomas Jane. But the lo- also when he was like, "Well, this is my first time. Don't I get like three strikes?" And then they get out the notepad, and then this he's like, "Gelato, <laughs> gelato isn't vegan." And then they said something else. He said, uh, "Chicken isn't vegan." <laughs> that was great. Um, yeah, the um, and I I think um, see, there's so many like this movie has just as many funny quippy dialogue jokes as it does like funny background visual jokes like yes. um there's one part near the end after scott has defeated um gideon and he turns into like a million coins and then uh sex bomb in the back they're saying like oh what or uh what's his face it says uh are we not gonna get paid and kim says yeah we're, we're not gonna get paid and so they're like trying to gather up the coins and uh young neil picks up one of the coins and like puts it in his mouth <laughs> and it's really quick but when you see it, you can't unsee that. And so stuff like that is so hilarious, I think. Um, and, I mean, this movie has probably one of the highest, like, you know, I don't want to say, eh, I mean, just visual jokes like like that throughout the movie. I don't want to say it's one of the highest because I'm, I'm sure there's other movies that have more. But I was surprised by how much this movie was able to pack into it. Yeah. Um, like everything from where it's like my, like, uh, where we're. Uh, Ramon is like, oh, your hair's shaggy, and then just cuts back to his reverse shot. He has a hat on all of a sudden, <laughs> and he's like, "What? You want to go outside?" Yeah, um, it's great. I just like walking, you know, putting one leg out in front of the other. <laughs> yeah, um, I like the um, uh, there's when Knives comes to visit Scott after he's broken up with her, and then uh, Wallace like tries to close the door part way, and then you just see Scott jump out the window <laughs> and break the window. <laughs> Like, I remember seeing that in the trailers, um, and I didn't know anything about this movie, but remember that, and I was like, oh, that's funny. Um, what would you say your favorite joke of the movie is? Like, could be from any character, I guess. Oh, man. Um, one of my favorite sight gags, because I just, I've never seen it done this way before, because usually when you see something like this done, it's always someone trying to go even extra over the top because their mind is so blown mm-hmm. but it's where knives chow is like so, her mind is blown that they get to go behind backstage mm-hmm. to go talk with the clash of demon head <laughs> and her face just turns into an emoji yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so funny and like that is like i would have never thought to have done that if i was making this movie um maybe yeah. that's in the comic i don't know but like i don't know um i think that i i gotta say i don't think that was in the comic um and even that... if it was though you'd expect them just to be like okay just have your mouth hanging open like a less creative director would have done that. Like just, mm-hmm. just hang your mouth open a little bit because you're so surprised that you get to do this. But it's like somebody moves in front of her and then when they get out of in front of her, it's like her face is all blurred out and you hear this little sound effect like Bloom! and her face is just an emoji and it's really funny. And mm-hmm. like like an old fashioned like emoticon, like yeah. it's really it's really great. Uh, I don't know if it's my favorite joke, but one that we haven't mentioned was uh when Scott is talking to a, uh, Aubrey Plaza's character, and she every time she cusses, it bleeps it out, but you also have a little black bar over her mouth, and she yeah. does it several times, and he says, how are you doing that with your mouth? <laughs> uh, I thought that was good. Um, that was good. I did have a question for you. Uh, I've seen people, and I think one example uh, in uh, Screen Junkies, the YouTube channel, they did one of their honest trailers about this movie, and they mentioned that they personally feel like that Scott should have ended up with knives at the end. What is your thoughts on that? So that is a, a great question because doesn't he end up with knives in the uh, in the comic? That I I don't remember. For someone who <laughs> read the comic, I there's a lot about it I don't remember. But um, I I would have to look that up and see. Okay, because um, I remember like people saying they don't like the ending of this movie, mm-hmm. and then. Uh, they oh he, he should have ended up with the other one and then uh, first the the adult in me is saying she's still seventeen she's yeah. still a high schooler he's still like twenty two years old um I actually really like the ending of this movie um so you get this movie and it's like you get her as the damsel in distress and then you have Gideon shows up and he's like I'm gonna beat you because I love her and then he earns the power of love and I'm like yeah okay whatever. I guess like this, I felt like this movie was more smart than that. It just kind of seems like it's 
it, it's like it seems to understand relationships like very well and then it just kind of breaks down to i'm gonna take a girl away from you because i love her like that that seems very immature to me and then all of a sudden oh wait that's the point you know because then he gets the power of love and then he loses and then he gets to go over the entire third act of the movie again um and then what happens this time is he walks in with more confidence and he understands where he went wrong. He finds out that she's the victim of like an abusive relationship. And that's really what's going on here. As opposed to, you know, he gets more insight and he becomes more thoughtful and he's like, Oh, she, she has more going on with her than just, she's a little wishy-washy. She's wishy-washy because she's very anxious and nervous. And she's in a, she's the victim of like emotional abuse from Gideon. Like that's like mm-hmm. the whole thing that she's dealing with. And, you know, he was not, giving that any thought he was very self-motivated and only thinking about himself and so then he uh comes back and he's like i'm gonna i'm not gonna fight you for her i'm gonna fight you for me like i need to be able to take you out because like i respect myself more than to let you like uh like tell me what to do and take away like everything that i had done in my own relationship and that's that's your abuse getting onto me and i'm not gonna let you abuse me you know and it's like through that example, Ramon is able to like see that and, you know, not allow Gideon's abuse to continue to control her either. And it's like it's a very thoughtful, smart thing where I think the movie on an emotional level does or at least it becomes more mature than it ever had been. I think the movie is very thoughtful and understanding of people. And then it has something to say that I think is quite mature um, in regard to that. And then so when you get to the ending... And then she's just going to leave. She's going to keep being a drifter. Oh, and then I also think it's very smart that he has to fight Nega Scott. Mm-hmm. And then he doesn't beat him up. He makes peace with him. You know, yeah. that's a very thoughtful, smart thing to do. And it's funny as well. And then what happens is they agree, like, you know, I, I want to be with you, Ramona, because you're a dream girl. And I fought to be with you. And like Knives even points that out. It's like Knives is not really a character in this movie. And she might have gotten wronged and everything. But like just in terms of what that relationship would be it like it just kind of seems wrong for like them to not be together to me in terms of like like what would that really mean mm-hmm. and then and then so how does it end it ends like scott leaves he like leaves to be with her and like they're going to go start like she's starting someplace new once again but she's not starting a new alone she's starting a new with someone else free from all the baggage free from, it's like a really good metaphor i think for like working out emotional baggage and mm-hmm. um i i just think it's a very thoughtful smart ending so i really like the ending here um yeah and i i double checked and in the comic he does end up with ramon or ramona um but i think what i had heard was that they filmed an alternate ending in the movie where he ends up with knives and that may have made its way around the internet so you may have heard of that um and i I can I think I prefer that he ends up with Ramona if only like just from a narrative point of view he spends literally the whole movie like fighting for her and then at the end he says I'm fighting for myself now so there's that too but it would have felt unsatisfying to me if he spent the whole movie fighting for Ramona and then said I'm going to try and give this thing with knives another shot um just from a narrative point of view that would have felt like a cheat to me um and, and, you know, I've heard, I think the Screen Junkies guys, what they were trying to say was, well, Scott has a lot in common with Knives. And I was thinking, well, like, they played that dancing video game together. But other than that, <laughs> she she puts him on kind of a pedestal. Like, I don't really think they yes. have that much in common uh, as for a romantic relationship. And maybe they well, could have had something later, but at least in this movie, I don't really think they have anything that could have worked. Yeah, no, and I completely agree with you. If he stayed with Knives, he would have just been her Gideon, I think, because... Mm-hmm. She, he, he kind of has her under his thumb and can get her to do whatever he wants. And that, I, I, I don't know. Like, and she's also a seventeen-year-old high schooler, and that just doesn't sit right with me. Um, and also, I, I, by the way, I got to reference that joke where they're waiting for knives to get out of school, and he's with there with Wallace, and then he's like, "Oh, come on, there's there's boys here too." And then he looks at him like, "Don't play that with me." Uh-huh. <laughs> um, and then she says, "Oh, do you want me to tell you who all's gay here?" And he says, "Yes." <laughs> I was like, oh man, that movie. Um, I really like the joke where um, someone says, uh, or I think Ramona says, how old is Knives? And so there's that like wheel that you spin that you see it above Scott's head, and there's all those different <laughs> options, and it lands right in between who, her, and I gotta go pee. 
Because he says, I gotta go pee like three times in the movie. And so when it lands between those, he says, I'm gonna go pee on her. <laughs> <laughs> I think that might have been, that was probably my favorite one. Um, That's great. And apparently Nega Scott, they had a couple of deleted scenes where you see like a glimpse of him, like when he goes to the bathroom and then he's washing his hands and he looks up and briefly you see Nega Scott in the mirror. And I do wish they could have kept just a couple of those uh, throughout the movie to kind of lead up to his reconciling with his alternate self. Yeah, that could have been a lot of fun as like some like incorporating some horror filmmaking in there. That could have been mm-hmm. great. No, I, I agree. That'd been awesome. Um, but yeah, I um, I think the movie works better with him and Ramona at least trying to, because also by the end, he is no longer, because it's a weird thing where, it reminds me of that episode of How I Met Your Mother, I don't know if you remember it, the one where it was like, uh, Ted had this one girl, kind of, he was leading her on, making her think that someday there was going to be a relationship between them, but there really wasn't, and then there was this other girl that Ted had a thing for, and she was kind of leading him on, and then Ted realizes at the end like it's just a big vicious cycle i feel like there's that going on here where like scott has kind of put ramona on a pedestal as like the ultimate dream girl and then like she kind of you know because she broke up with uh or you know whenever she was dating gideon she kind of had him on a pedestal and he he was not treating her right and then knives is kind of worshiping scott and so i what i like about the end of the movie is that I feel like Scott, now that he's gotten to this point, he and her are going to actually have a relationship, and he's not going to be like, you know, she's out of my league, but for some reason she wants to hang out with me. That's awesome. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, they're going Mm -hmm. to be more on the same level. I agree, and I think emotionally by the end, they're they're at a similar, yeah, level. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, I don't know. I I, I guess I've never gotten why they he like he should have ended up with knives so i'm glad we're on the same page there then yeah um uh anything else you wanted to talk about with this movie i could quote lines all day <laughs> like when you just when you just like reference that whole like sequence where like the wheel in his head like i'd completely forgotten about it until you <laughs> just mentioned it and i'm like that's right that is one of the funniest parts of the movie um but i can't stress enough the editing is so good oh, yeah. like me like oh, yeah. like christy uh, my girlfriend she went to uh um uh she went to uh, art school and so she took like editing classes and stuff and and so like she knows how to edit and i also know how to edit and i watch too many movies and i pay attention to like editing and stuff and just watching this movie we both like every once in a while just turn to each other like the editing in this movie is insane mm-hmm. <laughs> like it was we were both in awe it was great yeah i i don't think i have anything else um i i like this movie i think i like it more now than when we first started talking about it because like i said at the beginning i wasn't sure where my critical analysis would land but i think i I still think that scott is uh you know a little bit scummy at the beginning to the point where it's like are you telling me he needed an entire movie to get to that point where he realized he was but by the end i like where all the chips have fallen i can uh, i can respect that um so we both like this movie um uh, Connor, what is the next thing you and I will be talking about? Since I probably won't um, be watching The Joker anytime soon. Well, um, you know, we got Maleficent 2 coming out, and I know you're a big fan of the first Maleficent. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. I, I have um, not seen Maleficent. I know there's a Star, <laughs> there's a Star Wars movie coming. Uh, I was going to say, I think it's Star Wars. Um, okay. Let me, let me pull up upcoming movies right now. Um, so I think Joker might get a Best Picture nomination because it won the Gold Lion mm-hmm. at the Venice Film Festival, um, but it might not because you know it's Are actually you... not getting great reviews. So... Yeah, I was gonna say I, and, and as we record this on October first, um, I I'm probably gonna put this up next week. Um, Todd Phillips apparently has said some stupid stuff here recently in an interview or something, but. Um, I, I just when I saw the trailer for this, I thought, why is everyone getting excited about this? Like, it didn't look like something. And I was never excited for a Joker origin story anyway. Um, even if you're gonna say it's just one of many possible origins, but looking at the trailer, I was still confused why people thought that it looked. And, and I'm not trying to like, I'm not trying to be mean if someone thinks that the movie looks good or is good. But looking at the trailer, I was a little perplexed at the excitement about it. I don't know. I, I don't know if I've told you about this, but like. I am way too like I'm my my Joker like uh, 
a uh, bridge has been burned almost. I want to, I, I feel like, like I remember when the dark Knight came out and every single 12 year old who didn't have friends had to do a Joker impression. <laughs> and like, you know what I mean? Like everybody. Like, yeah. And it was, it was like, and so like, I saw so many people uh, like do Joker impressions and like, Ooh, look at me being a Joker. And, and like, nothing makes me cringe harder than people just, you know, going a little mad sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> like that, that, what I just did made me cringe so hard, you know? So like, and I, and I see that and it's like, that is so not interesting to me. Just watching somebody <sighs> lose their mind. <sighs> like, it's so like, I don't care. Like that is like just one thing I really don't care. And especially when it's Joker, because mm-hmm. I've seen people try way too hard, way too many times. And this just looked like a movie that was all about that. And I'm like, I, uh, you know, like visually speaking, like production wise, looks like it has a good cast, good production values. It looks well made. I like Joaquin Phoenix as an actor, but like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's like Taxi Driver, but it's the Joker. Oh, yeah. okay. I can just watch <laughs> Taxi Driver again, and it's less cringy for me. So, which is to say, it's not cringy at all. Um, so, looking at upcoming movies, there's Zombieland Two. There's the Breaking Bad movie El Camino. There's Terminator Dark Fate. Ooh, I'm giving there's, that one a hard skip. Yeah. Uh, I... There's there's Doctor Sleep, which is the sequel to The Shining. The Shining. Yeah. There's Frozen Two. And then there's, you know, Star Wars. Yeah. Which I, I've just absorbed a few things about Star Wars just by accident, and a lot of it I don't know how much of it is conjecture and how much of it is like yeah this is definitely happening but i'm trying like with all the star wars movies i'm trying really hard to stay spoiler free on that one um would do we want to try and do another um like twin peaks related thing in between now and star wars because that's going to be in december isn't it that is oh and how can i forget cats (laughs) (laughs) i'm Um, I'm so excited to see people's full-on reactions to that one that one looks I'm not going to watch it, but it looks like oh. it would be a lot of fun to see people. My girlfriend has us going Christmas Day. It's happening. <laughs> she is just too curious. Um, to, yeah, so it's, it's like our tickets are practically bought at this point. Um, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, I, I'm totally down with doing another Twin Peaks related thing. Um, I guess, oh, and there's The Irishman, which is the uh, Martin Scorsese movie that's coming to Netflix. It's going to be three and a half hours long. It stars Ooh. Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, Joe Pesci, and Harvey Keitel. So there That's you go. quite a cast. Yeah. So. Um, well, let me let me put you on a spot. What kind of Twin Peaks adjacent thing would you want to talk about? Well, that's a good question. Um, have you ever seen Jackie Brown? I have not. Okay, that is a Quentin Tarantino movie that he did right after Pulp Fiction. It is based on an Elmore Leonard novel. Uh, called Um Punch, and uh, it stars uh, Pam Greer, Samuel L. Jackson, and Robert Forrester, uh, who played um, what's his face, his brother in yeah. Twin Peaks: The Return. So, yeah. Okay, yeah. I I was getting this confused with uh, a movie called Harry Brown that had Michael Caine in it, and <laughs> that's, that is not the same thing. Um, yeah. Um, do we want to try and shoot for like a month from now to talk about that? Um, sure. I'm I'm totally down to talk about Jackie Brown whenever. Uh, I think it's still on Netflix. Oh, cool. So. Good. Um, then that's one I will try and watch that one, and we can whenever we can do it, we'll do it. Um, and then uh, because I, I just recently uh, uh, have you ever seen The Stand? The uh, the it was like a four hour TV miniseries. I, I have not seen it. I'm actually reading through The Stand right now. Actually. Really? Okay. Yeah. Um, sometime in the future, after you finish that book, we might want to talk about the miniseries, because uh, it has Miguel Ferrer and Warren Frost are both in it. Really? Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Warren Frost oh. isn't... He's just a kind of a minor, but yeah, Miguel Ferrer is pretty present in it, so I'm, I bet you'd like it a lot. Who does he play? Uh, Oh, crap. Lloyd. Lloyd. Okay, it's... It's very interesting. Okay. Have okay. you gotten Have you gotten the Lloyd in the book yet? I have. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Who plays Who plays Stu Redman? Uh, Gary Sinise. Oh, Gary Sinise. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Very yeah. interesting. Um, yeah. 
and then who plays who plays the the rock star? What's his name? Uh, uh, Larry is his name in this mini. Larry series. Underwood, yeah. Larry and Underwood. I don't know the actor's name because it's a uh, he. I hadn't seen him in anything else, but his name, as I look him up, uh, was uh, oh no, have I missed him? Uh, see they they have it. Okay, here Adam Stork. I don't know. Oh if you know yeah, him. I don't know who that is. Okay. Um, Wait, no, his name's not Underwood. That's that's what's her face, right? No, Franny? no, it's Larry Underwood. Or um, yeah, oh. and then it's Franny something else. Um, Franny Goldstein, Goldstein. Yeah, something? yeah, yeah. That was it. Goldstein. Okay. Who plays her? Uh, Molly Ringwald. Oh wow. Okay, I'm not. This is not going to be me asks who plays who in the stand now. <laughs> but uh, that that's all very interesting to me. Okay, so um, yeah, I when in in a year when I finish that book, I'll totally <laughs> be down for talking about it. All right, cool. Well, uh, in the meantime, so Connor and I will sometime talk about the movie Jackie Brown, uh, and then before or after that, we'll probably be getting ready for uh, Star Wars: Rise of Skywalker, and then um, we'll talk about other stuff. Probably, uh, I don't know what we'll talk about, but yeah. Um, so in the meantime, I am the Comics Kid twenty ninety nine, and I'm Connor Nielsen, and we'll see you guys in the future. Have a good one.